So welcome everybody. Uh, as I just mentioned there, my name is Gail. I'm the Public Programs Officer at the Royal College of Physicians. And on the little cameras down the bottom, you can also see uh, Liz, who is our Collections Officer. Um, and of course, our main event, uh, our artist, Rebecca Harris, who we're really delighted is going to be uh, joining us this evening. I'm just going to hand over in a second to um, Liz, who's going to give a brief introduction to the museum um, and our online exhibition before we go over to Rebecca's talk. So, Liz, over to you. Thanks, Gail. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very sad not to be welcoming you into the building and physical exhibition this evening, but delighted to welcome, welcome you to October's Digital Museum Late. And many thanks to Rebecca Harris for joining us. So for those not familiar, the Royal College of Physicians is a medical charity, which represents 38,000 doctors worldwide. Our mission is to improve patient health and reduce illness. As well as being a modern healthcare charity, we are also a museum service, caring for a collection with a 500 year history. We have a huge range of collections, and in normal times, these are publicly available for research and displayed around our headquarters at Regent's Park. They're also used in our active exhibition and event programme. Although our galleries are currently shut, our exhibition is now online. So Under the Skin, Arts, Anatomy and Identity is available online. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> the exhibition looks at the tools and techniques used to create 3D forms of anatomical illustrations and the feelings these representations can evoke in us. Under the Skin also considers the power behind who and how bodies are depicted, so ideas about consent and dignity. We've been lucky enough to work with a range of contemporary artists in this exhibition, and they offer us reflections on medical representations and help us contemplate our relationships with our own bodies. Art on display includes Rebecca's fantastic textile pieces, including Deep Seated Anxiety and another textile piece featuring a representation of a black MRI scan, which I'm sure she'll be talking about very soon. So I hope you enjoy this evening's event. And as Gail mentioned, I'll be on hand monitoring any questions in the chats and um, we'll be here to answer any collect uh, collections questions generally at the end. So now I'm going to hand you over to Rebecca Harris. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, again, I'll um, um, reflect the um, sentiments of Liz. It's a shame we're not there physically because I think seeing the works physically is very important, but I hope you'll still get something from the talk. Um, so I'm going to focus obviously on the two pieces that are on the show and then there's some other pieces to illustrate some of the concepts I'll be talking about as I go through my talk. So for me, we have um, a close and intimate relationship with cloth. So I think of it as like from birth to death, we're enshrouded in this woven material. But like our bodies, we've become so familiar that we've stopped seeing it. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, how I adopt the concept of cloth within my arts practice and explore science and how I then stitch that. So for the past 10 years, um, textiles has sort of predominantly um, formed my art practice, but I've got no nostalgic talks of, you know, childhood memories of embroidering with my grandma or anything like that. It's just some self-taught um, um, stuff that I did in my teens. And then when I went to art school, um, it naturally sort of evolved into my arts practice. So um, I've always been fascinated by how you can use cloth and um, how you can, this everyday fabric, how it conceals our body. And then by using embroidery and manipulation of the materials, we can reveal our physical and psychological states with that. Um, I cannot see how I can now change to the next side. Sorry, it's gone for me. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I need to... Um, Sorry, Gail, how will I be able to do that? Because I'll need to be going to and fro with them. I can't if, you, um, if you click at the, if you, scroll, if you hover over the very bottom of your slides, you should see a back and forth, or you can use left and right at the bottom of your screen uh, on your keyboard. Okay. Uh, no, it's not working. It's gone for uh -huh. me. 
Apologies, everyone. It's like technical. Sorry. <laughs> I knew there would be one. Okay. okay. Oh, I can see it now. It's popped Try up. Try there again. Ah, okay. it must have maybe it hibernated. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Hopefully it should run smoothly okay. now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so where um, textiles is used to describe, um, describe my main um, art practice medium, I think for textiles, you can talk about weaving and knitting and dyeing and so on. So important, the important distinction for me to make here um, is I like to say cloth is my medium um, and not just referring to it as a literal piece of fabric. I think it's quite a complex subject matter. So, the, um, so I think it's, well, it's something that's been with us since the dawn of humankind it conceals our nakedness it protects us all from the elements and when you go into the etymology of the word and there's various um, languages across the whole of Europe that use this it it all stems from the word sort of covering I quite like that so next one so it's this two-dimensional object and it's um, we use it and craft it into a two onto a two-dimensional subject and we transform it into something that's much more than just its material status or it has power once it's been manipulated, constructed, dyed and embellished. It can convey gender and wealth and status, sex appeal and so much more. And um, it has so many varying practicalities and once constructed onto the body, this commonplace material um, is got an infinite um, possibilities when you adopt it into art making. And that's where I've been quite interested with that. So what you, um, where this cloth conceals and reveals um, about our lives and lived bodies, um, I use it as material to conceal and reveal so much more. And um, sorry, I've lost my notes. This, <laughs> sorry. So I want to um, reveal so much more um, about what we ignore about our bodies, and that might be physical or psychological. Okay. So when you look at sculpture and say someone's using clay or marble and they're making figurative work, when you use cloth in sculpture, I think it's not only speaking of, but about the body collectively as well. So this piece here that we've got in the uh, exhibition at the moment, this one, Deep Seated Anxiety, this um, was from my Obscure Objects of Obesity um, project. And um, I think, uh, the calico cloth that I use in that is makes a really good an analogy with um, the um, uh, skin. So I knew this was going to happen. My slides are all over the place. Sorry. So in this piece, when I was um, covering the form, um, I was. Um, can you see here the uh, the front of the piece with all the um, intestinal kind of. Um, stuffed tights. Now the whole of that piece was going to be covered um, in uh, those tights and so for me actually calico at this point was going to be a functional piece of fabric and then that was going to cover um, the whole lot. So as I was pulling it tighter and tighter trying to sew the seams together to make that nice smooth area to put the tights on, I noticed that it was like scars were appearing upon the surface and um, and for me, uh, the calico is like um, is like skin. It has this natural state to it that has these dark flecks in it that are like um, freckles. And it's a very functional fabric. And it's um, like it's awaiting um, to be um, elevated to another status. So for me, at this point, it was just going to be. Um, I just got a piece here. Yeah. It was just going to be a very functional um, piece on there, but I realised that as I was playing with it, when those, as I was putting those scenes together, that was something quite interesting was happening with the work. And sorry, this is where I've had to go to and fro slides now. So this is where I got interested in the skin, um, the fabric being analogous to the skin and how I could take this covering that I was putting on a torso like um, object and then trying to suture 
these seams together to um, sort of reconcile these two exteriors together. So we go here. And onto this one a minute. Sorry, you'll have to bear with me a second. I'll leave you with that one a minute while I try and find out where we are. Don't ever do last minute changes on a slide before doing a talk. I want that one. I didn't realize it was that messed up, okay. So um, these pieces, um, as I said, were from my um, body of work on obscure objects of obesity. So I um, started looking at about dramatic weight loss and that relationship to the skin. So in my research, I was looking that in weight gain, that um, no other organ is physically or altered visually more physically or visually altered than that of the skin. So in weight loss, that encasing membrane doesn't shrink. And then it often has the stretch marks as the indices I call to what the skin endeavored to contain. So in this piece here, um, I actually took the, um, the I, um, it was, I actually took a picture of um, someone's um, torso and recreated um, their stretch marks as these beautiful um, little slices of um, embroidery onto the fabrics. So I quite liked that idea of taking something completely flat and almost like um, a, a, oh, the word, um, were you, um, oh, it doesn't matter, but the, um, like a sliver of skin and trying to convey something of someone's body onto this some um, sliver of um, fabric. So if we go back to, yeah, so um, these ones here, so um, these ones are called Life Sucks. So it was also part of that project. So here the tights are um, not just analogous to the skin, but they're actually pretending to be skin and they're literally worn upon the skin. So continuing this theme of the excess skin, um, I took the stretch unfilled tights to reference old, tired and sagging breasts. So for me, calico is like a material in waiting, a sort of debutante waiting its transition into something else. But for the tights, um, they already have a thingness in the world. They're already an object of the world. And they're quite easy to introduce into the artworks because they signify something already. But I've always been particularly drawn to these nude colored tights because for me, they're like a pseudo skin, this very fine diaphanous material that barely conceals the body. But once the person is um, wearing it, this ultra thin material makes the wearer feel like their legs are somehow not exposed. Um, and it has this, what I call this subtle skin mimicry um, and then it streamlines and smooths the contours of the legs and takes away any blemishes and things like that. And we go on to there. So my fascination with the female skin sort of commenced with that looking at what happens to the skin with dramatic weight loss. But this was really amplified when I was doing research and I come across um, the work um, by Claudia Benthian and her book on skin, which on the cultural border between self and the world. So um, in her analysis of the skin, she talks about our tendencies to fetishize the surface of the female body. And that focus on being uh, that women, woman is uh, conceal, has this, con her skin is this concealing veil of what makes her other. And that's where the coding of her femaleness um, takes place on her skin. And for the male body, it's different. The male body is defined by his muscles and veins beneath his skin and the hairy skin. Whereas for a woman, the skin has to be smooth and flawless and completely blemish free. So I was quite, that's where it sort of accelerated that interest in the skin then was through reading that stuff. And I think we're here now. And 
So in this piece, which makes it different to the use of the material in the uh, deep seated anxiety, is these are retaining some of the original format as such. They're, they've still got the gussets and the legs protruding out the gusset and then just simply just tied off and just to represent the sagging breasts. But when you go back to this piece, it's, um, it's just used as material. That's where I think is the distinction there. And um, this uh, artist here, Senga, Nugudi, I guess, apologies to the pronunciation there. So my preference for tights is sort of reflected in um, what she says about um, tights and how it represents a human body and how there's only so much pull and push that the body can take until it never resumes its normal shape. And... But in deep seated anxiety, like I said, I, I no longer use them so much as a found object, but they've been manipulated to um, be constructed into this intestinal visceral type of um, construction. And to contrast that, I've got this piece here that I also made at the time. And this was made from an extremely long piece of tumble dryer hose. And it was all twisted and turned and then um, suspended um, as like an insulation into a space. So it was a quite a large piece. And the reason I wanted to talk about this here was to make that distinction about the importance of the material that you use in whatever um, imagery you're trying to convey. And so first of all, this dwarfs the body of the viewer and also about the material it doesn't have a bodily empathy is what I call um, with the viewer. And the power that um, that has is with um, cloth. Um, if here we go. And so with soft sculptures, um, you can it connotes the body quite well it evokes a bodily empathy and Bryony Fur when she's talking about the French artist Annette Messer Message. Um, she says about how um, there's anthropomorphism in it and it has this bodily projection and empathy and you can create bulbous forms and organic forms and it is it has inscribed on it the erotics of the body and then so it's not so much about these works conveying something of the body it's how the body is present in reading the artworks as well which I think is quite important that the body has you as a viewer standing there, you are an axis for um, per, um, perception and that we are our bodies and we're of the world. And so I was interested when I was researching all this stuff that the French philosopher, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty and how we perceive our worlds through our bodies. So through the manipulation and emphasizing the materials and objects that already exist in the physical realm with us, I use the materiality to create a dialogue with our bodies, which brings us to this piece. So the challenge then for me was if I can make these bulbous forms and have this direct relationship with the viewer and how can I convey um, something of the body, but now make it completely too dimensional form. So I started with looking um, with MRI scans and this was the first one I went with and because I find the MRI scan you can really depersonalize the figure and what really interested me here, this is one I digitally um, uh, manipulated, was you can see the thin Kate, the thin person beneath the fat. And so the reading of this sort of oscillates between the two. And then this piece here was another one relating to an MRI um, scan. Um, this one I think was almost going to be on show at the RCP, but there wasn't space in the end that was decided. But this is a much, much bigger piece, quite large. And I took a sort of birth of Venus like modest pose of this morbidly obese figure. Um, but as you can see, it's digitally manipulated because um, of the position of her arms, because as an MRI goes through, it wouldn't have been able to have made that slice. Um, but this is cross stitch, and I don't know if you can quite get the sense of it um, just on the um, screen. 
But this, um, although this is uh, two dimensional, for me, it wasn't quite getting there in a three dimensional um, sense. It's quite easy to um, draw an image of a figure and convey something of the body. But how could I do something in 2D and try and make it three dimensional? And then um, with, I notice as I was going through, actually, I might go to this one first, the MRI scans, the, uh, this is the actual one that I used um, for the piece um, uh, um, RCP. Um, I'll just click through these. I realized that once you trace around these um, edges, you could create a sort of topographical map. So where maps are used to convey a sense of um, three dimensions, it tells us about how steep something is or how high something is. As I was playing with these um, scans, I realized that once I put it all together, I could create this image here. Let me just catch up with myself on here a minute. So for me, this wasn't just um, a functional way of creating something um, to convey, a, you know, uh, the image of a body. I think it also um, gave me an opportunity to say something about how we view bodies as well. So where the MRI scan looks, it's quite depersonalizing of the body. When you create something that just makes you removed any human aspect, I think, from this and you've created something that um, you've put someone's body as a landscape something that is she's been completely now um you know objectified she's got the you know you're looking over the fatty landscape of um you know her figure and so that technique i then adopted um into this piece here which uh, was commissioned by the Wellcome Trust and the Eden Project and it's part of the Invisible You exhibition there and it it lent itself really well to what I was trying to do with that piece because we, in the exhibition, we wanted to talk about how microbes are beneficial to our health and, and not be scared of germs and things like that. So I wanted to do something that was about them being em embellishments rather than blemishes on our skin. So for me, if I could take the body as a landscape and get this sense of all these trillions, because we're outnumbered, I think something like 10 to one of microbes to human cells, of these trillions and trillions of microbes all over our body that colonize our landscape of our body. And because they wanted to talk about bodies being an ecosystem, I thought this worked quite well because then the body was like, as we think of ecosystems about, you know, a, um, a, you know, a physical landscaped area. And then what this one has done, so like the previous one here, uh, we were just focusing on just the contours and the lines and the black really enables the white lines to, to sort of really jump out. And I'm sorry, I don't think I've mentioned, and you might not be able to see in the picture if you haven't seen the piece um, in uh, the flesh as such, but this is um, a machine embroidery and not um, a drawing. And then going back to this one, so this is machine embroidery and then with the hand embroidery um, on top of that. But for this, we've now returned back to the calico material because what was important for me now was to focus on the colours and the intensity of where all the colours meet and things like that, that, um, that that's what the, you know, the neutral background for the calico would um, enable me to do. And um, so in closing, what I wanted to say is that for me, the power of, um, of cloth, there really is a potential to affect the viewer. And it's and also it's about the uh, the act of the embroidery, how the material has been manipulated and constructed, how we use our bodies to read um, the artworks. There's um, a tactility, a sensual capacity, how we you can evoke parts of all aspects of the body. And um, I think it has quite a huge effective potential um, with the viewers. Um, with these pieces and that's why it's quite disappointing we haven't been able to see them um, today but I think that's what I wanted to talk about really and I think we're done.
there. I don't know if we wanted to go to questions now, Gail. Yep, wonderful. So um, Liz, if you're okay to join us again, and um, we'll all go up um, on screen. Okay. Hi there. Okay, hello everyone. So um, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for that. That was fascinating. Uh, and I, I do agree, I, I understand with the tactility of your pieces that you're so disappointed we can't be showing it in person but um i think that was it was really great to give people a, a bit of a perspective on on what you've provided us for us in in the exhibition um and yeah we'd like to throw it out there to questions if anyone would like to start a, the discussion with rebecca okay. if you just want to pop it in the q a or in the chat section wait for everyone to start typing <laughs> yeah sorry it didn't flow as well as i'd <laughs> like it to but i knew that when i changed the slides at last minute and i was going to and fro in front of them that it was good yeah i knew it was going to go wrong <laughs> So we what, have an um, Oh yes, we do have one. I was about to ask one myself. I will keep it. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got here a question from, who's it from? It's from Siobhan. Um, wanted to know, were the MRI scans used taken specifically for the project or repurposed from ones taken purely for medical reasons? Um, so I, I can't remember the name of the software that I use, but um, they were available online. And I think, um, are we able to show the, um, we were able to pop back to things at all or not? Yep. Do you want me to, which, uh, we can go back to your presentation. Was there something you wanted to show? Yeah, because I think I'm just referring to here. Yeah, I think it says, if you just see at the bottom here, it says not for medical usage. So I think therefore they were for um, sort of training purposes or something. It was freely available um, online um, and a Cyrix or something like that it was called. Yeah. And I use that for um, all of my um, works and there seems to be loads available online. And it took me a huge amount of time to figure out how to use this software. Um, and then because they don't just go like every, you know, inch into the body, they're, they're just so it was hundreds and hundreds of them all the way through the body. So you had to, you know, be quite selective of which ones to pick, you know, because I didn't want to be sewing lines for the rest of my life on onto the embroidery. But it was quite, um, yeah, and it was an interesting process. I've wanted to make more pieces, but it is, it's, um, yeah, a bit of trauma related when I return to it because it's so difficult it's humongous amount of work to do that process it was I think related to that uh, Amanda had asked about um how you approach the your subjects to get consent so it sounds like these were uh freely available yeah and um one thing that I did in particular oh sorry can we go back to the oh, yeah. slide again and I was just about to click uh where is it um yeah one thing i did in particular here um so the um was to protect the identities um so although um you never get um an mri scan that goes from um you know finger uh to toes so this is actually of two it's like frankenstein this was mm -hmm. <laughs> these are two separate bodies um, and then I had to um, do a lot of digital manipulation because um, um, I don't know um, if, if I'm speaking for myself here, but when women lie down, so most of the time the breasts are not very prominent anymore. So I had to reconstruct <laughs> the drawing of the breasts and then I completely changed the identity of the face as well. So um, it, it was a starting point, really. So it was important for me for the ethics behind that, that, you know, you wouldn't possibly be anyone will come and see the work and go, hang on a minute, that looks like my MRI scan. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. so that was those. Fair enough. Um, we've got another one from uh, Nicole, which is rather interesting. She wanted to know, do you think the use of cloth in depicting the female body links to the domestic role expected of women? 
Um, yeah, that was uh, um, Subversive Stitch is um, one, I think all um, textile students in the fine art context um, read um, about that um, domestic relationship between um, cloth and stitching. And that's like in the, um, the Life Sucks pieces, you know, there's intent behind there that they it's um, framed within an embroidery frame. Um, so it's it's always about referencing um, the domestic roles um, and things like that. So yes, definitely. Mm. Okay. Um, we had a question from uh, Ema. My apologies if I'm saying your pronouncing your name wrong there. Um, who firstly wants to say really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, and uh, was wondering how you approach your choice of medium to manipulate the fabric, e.g. hand or machine stitch? Um, it depends on what's needed, really. Um, so the so the actually the French knot piece for the Eden Project commission, at that point, I've never in, in my life ever <laughs> embroidered a French knot. Um, so I actually have... Um, if you see up there the the oh you probably can the original hand literal hand embroidery that i did for the commission um uh for the interview for the eden project and you can see the start of that but um, by the end how the french knots were perfecting over time <laughs> but um at that point it it was it's for me it's just about um thinking about what it is i want to make and how will the best process be to make that um, so for doing the lines of the um, MRI scans, um, it was quicker to do it on the machine and it was more, um, it had a, a better, it just looked better as well rather than the uh, hand element. But by the time you had to uh, finish that piece, you, it's like how much of it was hand embroidery, machine embroidery in the end, because I had to unpick so much and perfect it. Um, it was really quite a laborious process, um, that one. So it's a mixture of the two, um, really. And a lot of the times um, when I, it's, maybe I'm stuck for punishment, but when I do certain projects, I might never have done that technique ever before. And then I have to teach myself how to do it and then start it and learn as I go along. And so it'd be nice if I would actually repeat some, you know, some methods and save myself some hassle. Okay. Um, we had a similar question from Liz. I think Liz Marley, I think that's actually covered the same kind of thing about machine embroidery versus hand embroidery. Um, Amanda has mentioned that she's been working on um, skin and, and uh, discovered the historical correlation between skin and fabric um, by the art historian Met Met Metchit. Hildfend, Mitch to Hildfend. I apologise, I cannot okay. pronounce it properly. Um, I don't know. Have you heard uh, of of that? No. Uh, okay. No, I haven't. Um, no, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Um. So that's and what else has she said there? Deriving from the realm of textiles. Yeah. Yeah, because um, for me, it's um, the skin is um, a boundary in a container. Mm. It's holding in the body. It's um, covering the body. It's concealing the body. And then we add, then we add this extra layer on top of that to do exactly the same role. And then that cloth that we put on top of it, we can be manipulated in so many different ways and convey so much about our identities as well. And then so I like to think about how is it that this thing that is concealing our bodies, what can I do with it to reveal something mm -hmm. about our bodies? Okay. Um, I had a question if anyone, if no one else does. <laughs> um, oh, no, we've got another one coming. I'll have to wait. Um, so from Anna, uh, she wanted to know, um, she said she was interested in the tensions between textiles being tactile and art generally being something that can't be touched and in relation with personal space and boundaries okay yeah that's a um good one because because uh, i've already brought up the eden project piece mm -hmm. so when we were looking in the space i don't know if anyone's been in the space and seen where it is um the initial um offer was um because the wall's quite slanted a lot of the artworks were being actually cut into sort of um pigeonholes or you know cubby holes into um, the space and then perspex in front of them 
so they asked whether I wanted to have my piece, you know, put behind um, Perspex because they said it's permanent display there, which means it will be there for at least five years. And mm -hmm. I know at one point they were having up to a million visitors a year. So they said a lot of people are going to be touching this work and, mm -hmm. you know, that it could be ruined by <laughs> this happening. And um, I actually put the case forward that I wanted it to be touch. I wanted it to evolve over mm. time with people. And that how it was, because we're talking about microbes and the invisible, I wanted to see how the piece would actually um, evolve with the viewings and where mm. and you can see where people touch it, where it's been touched the most and the mm. dirt that's um, building on it. And the other really important thing, the obvious really important thing, is it's tactile. It has to be touched. The reason, yeah. uh, if you're being um, drawn in and you want to, you know, touch the work, that's part of the work for me too. Unless mm -hmm. I'm specifically and explicitly doing something about not being able to touch it, then I will make mm -hmm. the work, um, you know, that behind Perspex, you're not allowed to touch it if that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't about that so it had to be touched and it was important and also the other aspect for me is when I was talking about accessibility that although you can see the blaze of colours and all the congregations in places um, for those um, um, uh, with um, um, oh, um, sight problems um, you would be, be able to touch it that they even if they weren't able to see it they you would be able to touch it and follow mm -hmm. the contours you would be able to touch in the center of the the um, pregnant torso wow. you know that, that it's completely blemish free in there well sorry not blemish I tried not to use that word didn't I mm -hmm. embellishment free there where the um so with the baby um you're actually micro free before you're born um so again mm -hmm. that was important for me um so um, asked. yes we have had a couple more so uh we've had from from katie hello katie um <laughs> she's asked um regarding face coverings so an interesting one in this day and age do you think the new world of wearing face masks has changed the way we think about cloth and covering our bodies it might do but i think we will soon um forget it this is, I think we become, um, this is what I mean when I started at the beginning, when it's talking about how we become so, it's so present and we become so familiar with it, we stop seeing it and we stop being aware of it. Mm. And this was something um, I enjoyed them, Abs The Absent Body by Drew Leder or Leder. Um, and he talks about um, how, where we when we stop being aware of parts of our body until something goes wrong with them, mm. and and so I think like um the sort of social conscious at the moment is thinking very much about the invisible world of viruses and things like that, and um I've noticed recently um after going into the shops and wearing the mask that I've got home and I've been in the car and I've worn the mask all the way home, got into all the <laughs> shop and it's still got the mask on, and I think we just eventually you get so used to stuff you you stop seeing it really mm -hmm. um so it, it it offers um quite a lot of things you can do with um that potential then with art is to remind people of things mm -hmm. and i think that's a lot of power with art you you can make people see things that they've stopped seeing or you want them to look at or something like that okay um, I'm following on from that in, in relation to COVID, you were talking about your work um, uh, in the Eden project being very tactile and, and touchable. What's its situation now? You know, can can people go in? Can they still touch it given I'm not know, all the COVID sure. restrictions? Yeah, I'm not sure what um, that's like, but then there's, you know, there's curtains is you know the status of my artwork you know when you literally boil it down to it's no different to you know a curtain when you walk into a room you mm -hmm. know so it's not that we're being told not to touch the curtains or um i don't know you know i'm assuming people i don't have no idea i don't know what's no. happening i know they're limiting the amount of people that can go into the eden project at any one time but you know there's the people even if it's behind perspex, people will still be touching the perspex, you know. So it's there's always going to be something that's going to be touched, isn't it? I suppose, but um, but then you can't disinfect my work. But 
who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Or well, you can disinfect your hands. So maybe they'll provide so people can clean their hands yeah. before and after. Um, I don't know. That would be interesting. It would be interesting to find out what's what's happened with that there. How how long is it at the Eden Project for? Um, well, they when we well they just said permanent display, and then they oh, said wonderful. it's always a minimum of five years, and it's been in there mm -hmm. for five years now. So I don't know if it's on borrowed time, <laughs> <laughs> but um, a couple of years afterwards, so we had the Invisible You exhibition in um, this centre of the building, and then outside of that, now they've got the Invisible Worlds exhibition. So the mm -hmm. two are sort of all tied in together. So I think we're just running off. Um, of that taking us a few years forward, but who knows? Okay. Um, we haven't had any more in the chat and Q&A yet. If anyone thinks of anything, please do say. I had a question about deep-seated anxiety. Um, as much about the, the title of it, um, you know, because that really is, you know, when you hear that straight away, I, I put an interpretation on on the, the object itself. When you were making it, did did you start out wanting it to be an anxious thing? Because it sounded in your talk as if you were kind of just playing around and seeing what it looked like, or did you have in your mind straight away, I want it to represent anxiety, what I'm creating? Um, no, it was, that was one of my very much playing pieces. So um, mm -hmm. I called that when I wrote about it, my thinking through making approach. Okay. So it, it evolved as, um, so, um, so like a, what we, um, I remember writing at the time, a reflexive practice. So doing interdisciplinary research at the time. So researching into that biomedical stuff, that interventions into the obese body or those, you know, were medical treatments, surgical interventions, things like that. So it would, it was as I'm making, I was thinking, you know, I was started off with this intestinal like piece and, um, like I said, I, I I was just using calico as a as a base. It it was it was my naked skin as mm. such on the piece, and that I was going to um cover it all over with all these in turning um you know intestinal like stuff tights. And I remember at one point thinking, God, this is going to take me ages. <laughs> and then um thinking, did I really want to do that? And then I. So it was almost like I was trying to find an excuse not to cover it. But as I was doing all the calico, I was thinking, oh, my God, this is really looking like um, that where we're trying to, you know, we've got all this excess skin when someone's lost weight. And then you, you've, you um, you know, slice bits off and pull bits in here and you've got a seam here and a seam there. And um, so I had some of the tights already on it. And luckily at that point, I'd only put them in that um, sort of abdominal area. Mm -hmm. And I and it was just like, oh, no, I think this piece is coming into its own now. And then when I because most of my works, as um, you've seen, they're all untitled comma, you know, I'm in brackets, <laughs> black MRI, red MRI. <laughs> so it's very rare that I actually get the inspiration to actually give something a title. And like you said, it's interesting because it, it changes your perception of the piece mm -hmm. as well. So if I title a piece, it's it's significant enough to give it that title. And so for me, it was, I was seeing something about anxiety in it and it was deep seated and it was visceral and it was in, mm -hmm. in that gut area. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it sort of evolved into that. Okay, thank you. Um, any other last questions or shall we uh, finish up a little bit early this evening? A minute for people to type. Liz, did you have any questions? <laughs> oh, we just have one. No, just lovely, brilliant talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, Rebecca, did you take any before and after photos of your work at the Eden Project? In terms of what it looked like when it was installed and then five years later of being handled because it'd be really interesting to see the two side by side yeah it would be um the problem is um in situ it's a nightmare to photograph because you've only got about three foot space behind you to step away from the piece and as you you know and it's full length um piece so you to photograph it there will be um it's not very easy it got photographed before it was installed mm -hmm. you can get little snapshots of it and the lighting isn't very is a very very dark space um i haven't personally been to the eden project for a couple of years yet so i haven't seen it but even at that point two or three years in it wasn't really 
that noticeable that it's you know it's it's not been destroyed or anything it's not been dramatically changed but there'll probably be a point when it's finished um the show that i'll be able to photograph it again and we can look at it but it'd just be dirty i expect that's all it is <laughs> but i do do although i go oh yes it would be lovely if everyone can touch it but it was sprayed with um you know fabric protector and obviously mm. um what's the stuff flame retardant and things like that yeah but um hopefully no one tries to set fire to it but, <laughs> yeah, but. thank you yeah. okay all right i think we've um uh, exhausted the questions if that's um yeah, everyone's saying lots of nice thank yous and things for thank you, Rebecca. You. And I'd just like to pass on ours as well from the Royal College of Physicians. It's um, We are disappointed we can't welcome people into the building right now, but it's so exciting to be able to hold some digital events and uh, still be able to um, engage our audiences with fascinating artworks that we've had on display. Um, just before we finish, I'm going to do a quite a little bit of a plug. So if you don't mind everyone. So um, I'm just going to put this up here um, and just say that uh, we've been so delighted that all of you could come along this evening and enjoy Rebecca's fantastic talk and ask lots of interesting questions as well, which have been great. Um, if you did enjoy this evening, we'd ask if you consider um, maybe helping us a little bit further. Um, so uh, with the impact of COVID, charities like ourselves have, and other museums, as I'm sure you're aware, have really been hit hard. And um, we do have a support page now. And if you would be willing to offer us a small donation, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I think Liz is going to pop the link again in the chat as well so that you can click on it. Um, even 50p would be great. <laughs> Anything just to help us be able to put on more um, fantastic events like these with, uh, with artists like Rebecca um, and uh, historical speakers like Katie, who was last time. Um, and we've got more events coming up. So if you enjoyed this one, if you'd like to come along, our next uh, Museum Late um, is on the 5th of November, first Thursday of the month. Um, with Andrew Carney, whose work is also featured in our exhibition. Um, he's going to be talking about his pieces, uh, which are these amazing laser cut um, artworks. Uh, and uh, the theme he's given me is boundaries in the body. He hasn't given me too many details. He's keeping mystery. So I think if you want to come along and find out more about his work and inspiration, um, then uh, you'd be most welcome. So please just head online to our website, um, History RCP London. Um, dot ac dot uk forward slash events and uh, you can book um, your place on our next free talk um, and I think that's pretty much it and we've finished up a little bit early um, so uh, yeah unless anyone wants to say anything else I think that's thank yous and uh, good evening to everybody okay. thanks everyone for coming thanks guys for hosting tonight um, we'll We've been recording tonight, as we said in our emails, and we hope to post um, the video on YouTube. Uh, we'll aim for next week. Um, so if anyone missed any bits, came in a bit late, you can catch up um, uh, with the video. And of course, there'll be captions on the YouTube video uh, available. So if anyone had any difficulties um, hearing anything this evening as well. Okay. Oh, and I've also got, um, I'm writing it as a blog post. So if anyone wants That's to pop to the website and um, read it in a much more coherent, streamlined <laughs> method. It was great. It was great. Okay. All right. Thank you, right. everybody. Uh, Thanks. Hope to see you all again soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.